them every day for a week and see what that does for those things that have been troubling your spirit. So from Psalm 73, 26, David said, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18, Paul says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Those are definitely words to hold on to and words to live by. We're going to have a fun time, I think, today with the message. So the title today is The Will to Carry On When Faced With Loss. You know, I think that term right there, loss, is probably one of the broadest terms we have in the English language. Loss encompasses so much. Whether it's the loss of a loved one, whether it's the loss of a job, whether it's the loss of a dream, whether it's loss, you can think of a million things. Things that did not go the way you wanted it to, or something you lost. <laughs> Leaves a hole in your heart. And it's at those times where we have two choices, right? We can either become bitter and angry and mad at God. He's a big God. He gets that. And that's okay. But the problem is when we stay there, when we let that anger and that sadness become complete bitterness to the bone. Or, instead of running away, we can run towards God. And we can fall at His feet. And we can cling to Him during that time of loss. Knowing that if it's, if it's not so much a loved one, if it's the loss of a dream, or if it's a loss of a job, or a loss of a home, or a loss of whatever, God may have something so much better in store, or just different. Well, what I want to look at today, if you notice my shirt, it's amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We're going to be looking at a lot of men and women who were faced with maybe unbelievable loss that you didn't even know. Ones that, maybe songs that we have sung that you have cherished your whole life and you loved and you held dear, but you never knew the pain that was behind that that caused those beautiful words to be penned. We're going to look at the men and women who when faced with adversity, some of them did go the wrong way and then circle back. And other ones clung all the harder. So who here knows about Johann Sebastian Bach? You ever heard of Bach? <laughs> what you may not know, though, this is going to be a little bit of a history lesson, but hopefully not a boring one. So he was born on March 31st of 1685. I did not realize he was that old. Okay? He was born in Germany, and he died in 1750. So he was a composer during that whole Baroque era, era and most celebrated member of the large family of North German musicians. Think about that. He was way up there. He was at the top of his field. Although he was admired by all of his contemporaries, primarily as an outstanding harpsichordist, organist. Who here even knows what a harpsichord is? A few people? Yeah, it's a little smaller piano and it sounds really dingy and actually on uh, my Joyful Joyful song that I did on my CT, CD, we used a harpsichord for that. Um, he was an expert on the organ and Bach is now generally regarded as one of the greatest composers of all times. So when you hear that, you think, oh, well, good for him. Well, what you may not know was that there's a lot more to Sebastian than we know, Johan. He was a member of a remarkable family of musicians who were proud of their achievements. In about 1735, he drafted the genealogy, the origin of the musical Bach family. So see, this isn't new. People were even doing their genealogy even way back then. 
He traced back his ancestry to his great great grandfather, Light Mock, a Lutheran baker or miller, who late in the 16th century was driven from Hungary, the stark region of Germany, by religious persecution. Mm, this has been going on for a long time. He died in 1619. And there were locks in the area before them that may have returned to his birthplace. But what he did was, this guy used a cittern to mill and to play while the mill was grinding. So it's a little musical instrument. Johann Sebastian remarked, a pretty noise they must have made together. Think about that. You're at work and you just take what God's given you and you just decide how to turn it into a musical instrument. He said it, he learned to keep, however, he learned to keep time and this apparently was the beginning of music in our family. So think about that. Here you have one of the greatest composers of all time and who's he giving credit to? <laughs> his great, great granddaddy who sat in the mill and discovered his musical ability. But here's the other thing about Johan. He lost his little daughter, then his three sons, and then his wife. He later remarried and together with his second wife, Anna Magdalene, lost four more daughters and three more sons. Eleven, eleven children. Many researchers wondered how was Bach able to even cope with these losses? How come his breathing didn't stop? How come the music didn't just die? How come his heart didn't quit beating? And most importantly, how could he possibly go on writing songs, singing suites for cello, masses, concerts, the most beautiful music in the world has ever heard. Can you imagine? At the end of the score, he always wrote, Sole Deo Gloria, glory to God only. It's a lot to swallow right there, isn't it? God and just, he felt, he could have felt, like had taken everything away from him. Not once, but twice. How many times in his head was he going, what did I do wrong? Why am I being punished? But the worst part is, all the children had to suffer. And yet, at, and at the beginning he wrote, Lord, help me. He knew where his strength lie. He knew who he still looked to, even though he didn't understand the plan. It was always, Lord, help me, and at the end, glory to God only. The first commandment. So think about this. Whenever you hear Bach's music, you can actually pray during his music, because his music itself is a prayer. Bach's music is a conversation between man and God. He's not new, though. Who else did this all the time? David, all the Psalms. Our prayers are conversations between him and God. And even though David always asks the questions, he answers his own questions with, but God. God is my God. God is faithful. God is the one I cling to. Well, there's another song that you know, and I have told the story before, but I thought it was fitting to do it again. Horatio Gates Spafford, because there's a little maybe more than you didn't know to this story. So he was born in New York on October 20th, 1828. But it was in Chicago that he became well known for his clear Christian testimony. He and his wife Anna were active in their church. They had been faithful disciples, faithful followers ever since he was a youth and staying with his wife. 
Their home was always open to visitors. And they counted the world-famous evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, among their friends and close friends. They were blessed with five children and considerable wealth. Horatio was a lawyer and owned a great deal of property in his home city. Now, not unlike Job, you'll see a pattern here with most of these men and women. Tragedy came to great measures to the happy home. When four years old, their son Horatio Jr. died suddenly with scarlet fever. And then only a year later, in October 1871, there was a massive fire that swept through, you know, the Chicago fire? Well, that happened downtown, devastating the city, including many properties owned by Horatio. The day almost 300 people lost their lives and around 10,000 were made homeless. Despite their own substantial financial losses, Spanford sought to demonstrate the love of Christ by assisting those who are grief-stricken and in great need. Shortly after, though, the stock market crashed. And when he had left, he lost. Two years later, in 1873, this was the first stock market, not in the 1900s, Spafford decided his family should take a holiday to England, knowing that his friend, the evangelist D.L. Moody, would be preaching there in the autumn. Horatio was delayed because of the business that had been going on with the fires and trying to rebuild. So he sent his family on ahead, his wife and their four remaining children, all daughters, 11-year-old Anna, 9-year-old Margaret Lee, 5-year-old Elizabeth, and 2-year-old Tanetta. Now, on November 22nd of 1873, while crossing the Atlantic on the steamship, the, the Ville de Havar, their vessel was struck by an iron sailing ship. 226 people lost their lives as it sank with only 20 all four of Horatio Spafford's daughter perished, but remarkably, Anna Spafford survived the tragedy. Those rescued, including Anna, were found unconscious, floating on planks of wood, subsequently arrived in Cardiff, South Wales. And upon their Anna immediately sent a telegram to her husband, which included just two words, saved all. Receiving Anna's message, he sent off at once to be reunited with his wife. And one particular day during the voyage, a captain summoned him to the bridge of the vessel and pointing to his charts explained that they were now passing over the very spot where the Ville de Havar had sunk and where his daughters had died. It is said that Spafford returned to his cabin and wrote the hymn on the front of your bulletin. It as well with my soul. There and then the first line of which, when peace like a river attendeth my way. There are other accounts that say when that was written at a later date, but obviously the voyage was one deep suffering. It is clear inspiration of the moving and well loved him. Horatio's faith in God never faltered, and he wrote to Anna, a half sister, on Thursday last, we passed over the spot where she went down in mid-ocean. The water's three miles deep, but I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe, dear ones. After Anna was rescued, Pastor Nathan Weiss, one of the ministers traveling with the surviving group, remembered hearing Anna say, God gave me four daughters, and now they have been taken from me. Someday, I will understand the why. Nationally, Anna was utterly devastated, but she testified that in her grief and despair, she had conscious of a soft voice speaking to her. You were saved for a purpose. She remembered something a friend had once said, it is easy to be grateful and good when you have so much, but take care that you are not a fair weather friend to God. <laughs> Following this deep tragedy, Anna gave birth to three more children. 
but she and Horatio were not spared even more sadness. On February 11, 1880, their only son, Horatio, named after his brother, who had died, and also after his father, also died at the age of four. In August of 1881, the Spaffords left America with a number of other like-minded Christians, and they settled in Jerusalem. When we were there, they pointed out where Mark Twain had actually stayed when he penned the words that the place was so desolate at that point in time. But where he stayed was at the home of Horatio and Anna Spafford. And it was there that they served the needy, they helped the poor, and they cared for the sick, and they took in the homeless children, opened their doors wide. Their desire was to show those living about them the love of Jesus. You have to realize, they were among the Jewish community and did not know Jesus and did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. The original manuscript of Spafford's hymn has only four verses, but later another verse was added. The music, which was written by Philip Bliss, was named after the ship which Horatio and Emma's daughters had died, the Ville d'Avar. Horatio Spafford died of malaria on the 16th of October in 1888, and Anna Spafford continued to work in the surrounding areas of Jerusalem until her own death in 1923. You realize how long? 35 years she lived without Horatio. But she continued on serving God, being the hands and feet of Jesus. Both Horatio and Anna were laid to rest in Jerusalem, and it can be truly said that the words of the Spafford penned that it is well with their souls. The question that he poses to each and every one of you is it so with yours? There's another man by the name of Newton. When he was a youth, Newton began a pattern of coming very close to death. I think that was free will. <laughs> Examining his relationship with God and then relapsing into bad habits. As a sailor, he denounced his faith after being influenced by a shipmate who discussed with him the characteristics of men, manners, opinions, and times. A book by the third Earl of Shaftesbury. In a series of letters Newton later wrote, like an unwary sailor who quits his port before a rising storm, I renounce the hopes and comfort of the gospel at the very time when every other comfort was about to fail me. And that really doesn't sound so out of the question, does it? When we are especially, we don't have to make you lose something or someone. Sometimes we just want to take that free will and run with it, don't we? As if he escaped death many times, but it was of his own accord. He was running from God. He was constantly choosing to do that which he knew he shouldn't. And then, after reading some book, he decided that he had renounced the whole gospel. Because everything in life had failed. The only song I can get to that is, uh, Nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I want to eat some words of that. Yeah. His disobedience caused him to be pressed into the Royal Navy, and he took advantage of the opportunities to overstay his leave. He deserted the Navy to visit Mary Polly Collette, a family friend with whom he had fallen in love. After enduring humiliation for deserting, he was traded his crew to a slave ship, and he began his career as slave trading. In 1725, Newton was born in Robert Rapping, a district of London near Times. His father was a shipping merchant who bought up, who was brought up as Catholic, but had Protestant sympathies, and his mother was a devout independent unaffiliated with the Anglican Church. So they done their job. They brought him up in the church. They taught him about Jesus. They taught him about the Gospels. And yet, like the black sheep of the family, he decided to go his own way. But as we heard before, it didn't play out very well for him. Now his mama had an intended 
wounded Newton to become a clergyman. Moms, you ever have plans for your kids? The problem was she died of tuberculosis early on when he was just six years old. So now you can kind of see maybe why he was a little wayward. He grew up his whole life without his mama and without that influence and without that pressure. For the next few years, while his father was out to sea, Newton was raised by an emotionally distant stepmother. He was also sent to boarding school, where he was mistreated. At the age of 11, he joined his father on a ship as an apprentice. His seagoing career would be marked by headstrong disobedience. So, you know, when we first hear somebody later on, we don't know the backstory, do we? We always look at what their fruit is in the end. But everybody that's made bad decisions, there's usually reasons that lead up to that. I always said, that's why I pray to God, God, let me see people the way you see them, not the way I see them. Because honestly, the way I see them, I don't like them. <laughs> that's because I don't see their backstory. Well, Amazing Grace was written in 1772 by an Anglican clergyman and poet by the name of John Newton. Oh my gosh! His mama actually came through after all, even beyond the grave. So all that disobedience, he circled back. And he found God. And he decided maybe the gospel wasn't so bad after all. Newton wrote the words from personal experience. We kind of do that, don't we? He grew up without any particular religious conviction, but his life path was formed by a variety of twists and coincidences that were often put into motion by other reactions to what they took as his recalibrant insubordination. <laughs> he was pressed into service with the Royal Navy, and after leaving the service, he became involved in the Atlantic slave trade. And in 1748, a violent storm battered his vessel off the coast of the country of Dundalk, Ireland, so severely that he called out to God for mercy. Ah, shock, isn't it? When things go bad, really, really bad, that's where the rubber meets the road. We need to turn our back and get even madder at God and harden our hearts. Or it's those moments when all of those convictions from growing up come back inside our hearts. And we choose the right thing by crying out to God. While well, this moment marked his spiritual conversion, he continued slave trading until 1754 and 55 when he ended his seafaring life altogether. Newton began studying Christian theology and later became an abolished. Ordained by the Church of England in 1764, Newton became the accurate of Buckinghamshire, where he began to write hymns with the poet William Cooper. Amazing Grace was written to illustrate a sermon on New Year's Eve day of 1773. Did you know that? Amazing Grace was Avon Saint. It was a New Year's Eve. It says here that um, it had many verses and may have they didn't even have music to it, so more than likely the, con the congregation chanted the verses. And then in 1779, it debuted in print in Newton's own book of hymns, but settled into relative obscurity in England. It was one and done. Nobody even looked at it. It wasn't until America. The United States picked up on this, and it became a popular song used by the Baptists, the Methodists, preachers, and part of the Evangelists, especially in the American South. During the Second Great Awakening and into the early 19th century, it's been associated with more than 20 melodies. But you didn't know that either. You know, I actually, one of these days, I want to do that. I know a lot of songs that Amazing Grace goes to throughout all of the eras, so that'll be kind of fun to do. But I guess it's not so far off, because they were doing that way back when. 
See, if, if Newton would have just written that hymn and tried to hold on to it, probably nothing would have happened. But when he gave it back to God, even though they went dead in the water in England, at that point, God had other plans. Just like he had other plans for Anna Spafford. Just like he had plans for Johann Bach. When we give back to God that which he has given us and we allow him the chance to use it, there are no borders, there are no barriers. For many Christians, the church members and admires sickness has been a profound role for shaping. And some like Charles Spurgeon, Martin Luther, Persons struggled with chronic illness and pain. Others like Mother Teresa and Florence Nightingale responded in bold ways to the call and they fell on their lives to attend to the needs of the suffering. Whether on her feet from sickbed, Florence Nightingale worked day and night to save lives. Dame Cicely Saunders, Christian faith and love for Charlie Bell patients led her to found the modern hospice movement. Mother Teresa, she stirred a generation by touching the untouchables. And who did Jesus seek out? The lepers, the untouchables, those who were unclean. Cabrini, those of you who got to see that movie, Cabrini. Oh, it was wonderful. You really, really need to see it. She had a passion to go to China. She was a nun to help orphans there. But when all the doors get closing all the time and she wasn't supposed to go there, she set her sights on New York, America. Because she heard there was a horrible, horrible need for orphans that, that needed help. And through fatal chronic illness, she forged ahead facing unbelievable obstacles. It's all, it's a true story, and it's just unbelievable what she had to go through. But in the end, even going down into the gutters of New York to save these young men and women, she brought them up and started orphanages, and they even set fire to them, and she rebuilt all well on her almost deathbed. And when they told her, the doctor said, you don't have much time left. She looked him right in the face and she said, well, then I better get to work. And she lived another 20 years. She set up orphanages all over America and all over Europe and down into Africa and South America. And guess what? To even in. So what losses have you suffered? Death, health, a job, family, a dream. We have all had hardships and roadblocks, haven't we? Times where we were ready to throw in the towel and say, heck with it. Even Mother Nature's against me. I think my husband's kind of there. Every time he tries to plant a garden, he really it. it always gets hailed out, rained out, dried out. Heck with it. Like these men and women, what gave you the will to go on? What did you choose to do? Did you choose to turn your back on God and get mad, hold grudge, become bitter? Or did you turn to run and to cling to the one who was our rock? You know, David, as I said, wrote most of his songs. They are conversations with God. Some of his lowest and some of his highest times. And in Psalms 121, David asks, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? And then he answers his own question. He says, My help comes from the Lord who made heavens and earth, and he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. That is the joy that we have as Christians, knowing that we serve a God who not only watches over the Spirit, but He watches over you and me. We're going to sing one verse 
first verse of Amazing Grace. And then we're going to go into the first verse of it as well. So why don't you, you probably don't even need to look up Amazing Grace, you know that. Lord's Prayer, 
You even put that to song. So whether we're singing or we're praying, we can lift your prayer up to you. If you would join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. For thine is a So 